Senator, congratulations. I can finally call you Senator Hickenlooper. Um, Thanks so much. Very exciting. Have you talked with any of the Republican senators planning uh, not to certify the Electoral College results? No, not yet. Um, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm puzzled I'm, by the argument and, what, and how they view this as beneficial, but I haven't talked to them directly yet. Is trying to overthrow an American election an act of sedition? Well, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't. I, I know it certainly seems, if it's not illegal, it should be. Is it to the extreme of, we have a law from 100 years ago that says you are doing wrong by the country and we can lock you up for that? Well, I think that even on a more, just a more holistic terms, you're not doing anybody any good, right? We're facing right now the, the extreme challenges, not just of COVID-19, but of all the damage done to our economy, to public education, the kids who've been out of school and who don't have broadband, all these things. Uh, and if we're gonna deal with these, if we're gonna get the, the vaccines distributed as rapidly as possible and dramatically accelerate the number of people that are getting inoculated, uh, we need to be working together and to kind of go along and pander to President Trump and drag out what Clearly, every state has certified these results. Uh, in many cases, these are Republican governors, Republican secretaries of state who are saying this was a valid election. Uh, I think we, in, a, in a very serious way, we weaken our democracy. Are, are they committing a crime, these senators, with, if Wednesday they choose not to certify? Again, I'm not a lawyer. And I'm not. Gonna, you know, I'm the wrong person to ask of whether what's legal, what's illegal. Yeah, if it's not illegal, it should be. I think it definitely it's weakening our country. It's taking us in a direction that we don't have the luxury to, to you know, continue this kind of constant partisan bickering. And maybe this is the the moment where we decide we're going to turn the page and begin working together and 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 try to find common ground working together in common ground. Why would you ever work together with one of these senators that might not certify the Electoral College results? Well, because we are in a democracy and I don't get to choose who the other senators are. Uh, I, you know, we need 60 votes to do major legislation. So that's going to require a level of reaching out and compromise. Uh, I hope that this can be a very short episode. Whatever they've got in mind, it's hard to read their intentions from, again, I don't see any substance to what they're saying. Every lawsuit, with one minor exception, every lawsuit has been shot down in federal courts, in many cases by judges appointed by President Trump. They, I don't see the, 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 the point of, of what they're trying to do. That being said, January 20th, Joe Biden will be inaugurated as the President of the United States. And this country is going to have to move forward, and we need Republicans and Democrats to work together for that to happen. When was the last time you talked to Cory Gardner, and what was that about? I talked to Cory a few a few weeks ago. There had been a uh, uh, a regulation that came out of Homeland Security that was going to disadvantage one of our uh, companies, uh, Arrow Electronics, a big company in Colorado, and. I uh, know the CEO, and he'd mentioned to me that this was really going to ca cause them real troubles. Uh, and I called Michael Bennett, and I called Cory Gardner, because I was, <laughs> I'm a senator-elect, but Cory was still the senator. And Cory Gardner stepped right in, I mean, got to work, made phone calls, did just what I hoped he would do. He helped be part of the solution, uh, just the opposite of what you're seeing from so many of these Republican senators that are protesting the election results. Have you received the COVID-19 vaccine? I haven't. I, I, I'm hopeful I've got it scheduled for tomorrow so that I can go back and forth and, and do this work uh, safely. I've been pretty much staying at home over these last two months. Uh, my wife and I, uh, we know our neighborhood as well as I could have ever dreamed we'd know it. And we know each other's cooking. We know, we, we know things we never dreamed we'd know about each other. Do you believe that Jared Polis, do you believe that Governor Jared Polis is making COVID vaccination promises that the federal government cannot keep? Meaning, how can the Colorado people trust the process and trust that Washington can provide the supply needed when the governor has made surprise adjustments to the timelines and has changed the order of when someone can get a vaccine? Well, he's made some, some changes there. I think we should all be urging uh, Governor Polis 
and President-elect Biden to, to turn the dial and go as fast as we can. This should be one of those great moments where government comes together and really tries to get rid of the, the obstacles to progress. If you remember when we had the big flood in 2013, and originally the department, the CDOT came and said, well, we can't possibly get people back in their homes. We can't rebuild those roads and those bridges until the third or fourth week in January. And my response was, there's gonna be snow by then. If you don't make it by the middle of January, it won't, probably won't happen until March or April. Uh, we gotta go faster. And, and after some negotiation, CDOT agreed to get all those roads and bridges built, rebuilt, repaired, at least temporarily, in by, by December 1st. And they actually beat it by two days. And I had CDOT employees come up who had worked for nine consecutive weeks. They'd worked 90 hours a week. Think about working 90. I mean, you go to work, you, you eat at your desk, you come home, you, you eat on the way home, and then you fall asleep, and then you go back to work. They did that for nine weeks, and they thanked me. They said it was the greatest professional experience of their life. I think this is that moment where the president can make that kind of a request. Governor Polis clearly is making that kind of a request. And we push each other. I, don't, I think what Governor Polis, his sense of urgency is something we should not criticize. I think we should all emulate it. And here's a question that crosses Colorado and Washington. When should prisoners or people incarcerated be getting the COVID vaccination? Well, again, we have this hierarchy. We, we, I think we have to look at people that are elderly, the people at highest risk, uh, the soonest. And I think that goes down. Then you get into a whole complex trajectory of, of trying to break down uh, where do you get the greatest good from, from, every vet, from every inoculation. And I think part of that is tied to uh, you not having a supply chain that's delivering those vaccinations rapidly enough. This would be a much less important question if we could get these vaccines out even faster than we're seeing now. So, you know, some of the other countries are dramatically, uh, I mean, Israel is going to get all their our, vaccines out. I think someone told me that they were going to try and do it in a month or, or, or six weeks, the whole country. Uh, obviously, they're a much smaller country and the geography is a lot easier than it is in the United States. But we are a country that's built on supply chains and, and we can demonstrate leadership across the world on that. I think that's, that's what we should be focusing on. How do we take that expertise in, in logistics and put it to work getting us out of this, this pandemic as soon as possible? Given that supply that exists now, should prisoners be on the same line as long-term care facilities? Are you, yeah, so that's a question, that, Marshall. Which all prisoners? If someone's got was picked up for drunk driving and they're you know they're going to be in, in prison for a month, do, do they? I mean, how do you begin breaking down the severity of the offense versus the time they're in jail? I mean, the, the judges <laughs> are probably going to have to opine on that. Generally, that's given to the governor to set that kind of a policy up and. Uh, again, I'm not going to second guess what the, co what the governor decides. It's, he's got a hard enough job as it is. I'll end on this. After going through Senate orientation, what do you now realize you'll be good at for a job you originally didn't want and didn't think you'd be good at? You know, uh, I think I underestimated the value of being a good listener. And I, if you were to ask my staff, the people I worked with, Republicans and Democrats, both in the, in the, in the General Assembly, but also in the city of Denver, they'd say I'm a good listener. Some of them wouldn't say that many nice things about me, but they'd say I was a good listener. And I think that's one of the things that we're missing in Washington more than I realized or appreciated. And I think it's something that I can be a part of, of, of changing. And I, I enter this job with a lot of humility. I understand that there are a lot of people around here that know a whole lot more than I do, but I'm going to listen as hard as I can. Good luck this week. You'll probably be on TV a lot, I think. <laughs> You're probably right. Thanks, Marshall. See you later. You bet. Happy New Year. Hey, same to you.